22-11678, Suzanne Felix, the Zoning Board of Tisbury, and another. Dane, it's still morning, so you may proceed when you're ready. <clears throat> may it please the court, I am Daniel Dane for the appellant, Susie Palix. This case presents the broad question of whether the applicable standard the ZBA should have applied to Palis's proposal to reconstruct her house should have been a variant standard or the standard under section six of 40A, paragra paragraph one of section 640A. Could, 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 if I understand your um, uh, parties back and forth, um, a lot seems to pivot on um, the connection between lot and structure. And your argument is that there's really no pertinent case law that establishes that uh, for, se for purposes of Section 6, um, a lot is, uh, the cases in dealing with lots have nothing to do with structures. No, I don't think I argue that, they, that there's nothing to do with structures. Certainly in Bjorkland and, and the Bransford cases, there's a relationship in the pre-existing status here the, the, the pre-existing non-conforming status here does require a relationship between structure and lot, namely the pre-existing non-conformity was that the structure is too close to the, uh, the side yard. Um, so there is obviously a relationship. Yorkland and Bransford talked about if you were going to uh, expand a structure on an undersized lot, is that an increase in the, is that an intensification of, this, of the non-conforming nature of the lot itself? So there's clearly a relationship. Where there's a difference is, is whether or not you're, in, you're afforded the protections of section six. There's nothing in section six, paragraph one, or paragraph four. Paragraph one pertains to structures, paragraph four pertains to lots, that says that a change in the lot at some point means that the structure is no longer pre-existing. So in this case, to answer the question of whether it's a variant standard or this house from 1803 retained its status as pre-existing non-conforming structure. The court, the land court, in saying that the correct standard was a variance, cited a principle that a change of lot meant that a lot is no longer pre-existing. She then cites, uh, the, the land court then cites two change in use cases. But the, the jump that was made was that if there's been any change in the lot, the pre-existing non-conforming nature of the structure has been lost and the protections of section six are gone. There's nothing in section six that says that. I, I, I was um, uh, looking in the appendix, the record appendix, um, for the town's bylaw. Uh, and in particular, I was looking to see if there was a provision in the bylaw whereby a, a non-conforming use could be expanded or extended uh, through the special permit process. Um, I found the table of contents, but there was no bylaw. Uh, is, is that the condition of the, uh, of the record appendix? It, it, it's, only the, sound, it's, on, it's only the, chap the table of contents? Sound, yeah, that sounds right. I mean, I think this case turns on a question of interpretation of 40A. It okay. never so, turned on an interpretation of, of the bylaw itself. So you're saying, I take it, that um, you not only do you not need a variance, but you also do not need a special permit. Well. Uh, if we were, if the, if the protections of section six were afforded to this structure, then it, the context here was that an application was made under the variant standard. If the protections of section six still applied, then Palitz would, would, I mean, you're correct, would pull out the bylaw and in that case would reapply to the ZBA. And I just don't recall under the bylaw if the section six uh, finding is made through the special permit process, but at least 
the minimum protections of Section 6 would still be afforded. So there is a test, whether it's in the special permit process or in Section 6 itself. There's a standard that has to be met. Yeah, our right. argument is there is going to be ZBA review. And for something of that sort. It, there, there's going to be ZBA review. The question is whether it's the variance standard or whether at least the minimum protections of Section 6 still apply, which is you know, the not substantially more detrimental than the existing structure test. Yeah, I, I was not clear from, from reading your brief. Um, and and uh, one, of the, one of the ways I was trying to read your brief is to say that um, it, 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 you might not even need a special permit. You, you, not only would you not need a variance, but you also might not need a special permit if the Zoning Board of Appeals makes certain findings. Under the Is that right? Under Goldhirsch v. McNair, the appeals court left open the question of whether in all circumstances an additional height within a setback area constitutes an intensification of a of a non of nonconformity meaning setback. Yeah, but, but so I, I'm, I, I have a procedural right. um, uh, uh, solution that I'm trying to figure yeah. out. Mm -hmm. I, I, I understood your brief to also be saying, or to potentially be saying, that uh, even if there were a special permit process, you might not need the special permit or a variance, but you could simply go on findings by the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, pursuant to Section 6. Is that, am I correct in, in that understanding of your brief? Well, uh, she would be subject to whatever the bylaw says for the, for the procedure that the ZBA would follow. But what if there's the no special permit for an extension of a nonconforming use? Then she would just need a straight Section 6 finding. Um, so if yep. she applied, so Section 6 has three, has three steps, paragraph <coughs> one, as to structures. Is it a pre-existing nonconforming structure? If it is, then a change in zoning would not apply to it. That doesn't get to the question of an expansion of that. If there's going to be an expansion and it's a single or two family structure, then the next provision of, of paragraph one says that um, zoning wouldn't apply unless there's been an intensification of the nonconformity. So the ZBA in this circumstance would need to decide whether the, the uh, addition of less than 10 feet of height would constitute uh, an intensification of the nonconformity. If they found that there was an intensification of the nonconformity, of existing nonconformities, then the next step under Section 6 would be whether it's substantially more detrimental than the existing structure. Could you clarify your argument about why it is that a 1995 variance was not necessary in the first place? So I don't think that, that the relief we're seeking for Kalis's house turns on that question, but it is sort of a question that comes up in these cases. So apart from the status of the house thereon, if you're going to exercise an 81L plan to divide lots, um, we have the legislative history of 81L, which isn't terribly illuminating, but the, the legislative history seemed to indicate that there were certain types of land divisions that the legislature thought were in the public good and wanted to exempt from subdivision uh, control review by the planning board. And one of those was where there are existing houses, multiple houses on a single lot, is not a, a subdivision. Is it multiple uh, houses or multiple structures? Multiple, I'm sorry, you're, you're correct, multiple structures. I think in most cases it's houses, but yes, could multiple barns, structures. Could on be a, a house, a barn, and a shed. It, it, theoretically, it could be, you could separate those structures onto separate lots. Yep. So the question is, is if a variance is needed where the division would create nonconformities, um, does that essentially render an 81L plan a null set? And I think that the answer is yes, that if a variance was needed in order to do this where nonconformities were created by the division, there's really no circumstance where any homeowner or any owner of these multiple structures would utilize that mechanism. Well, yeah, but they would. Uh, it would, uh, if, if, uh, if ultimately they wanted to, let's say there were, as in, in this case, there were three structures that they right. wanted to break up into three separate parcels, um, it, you would want to, to get a, uh, an 81L plan uh, and then um, if, if, if you complied with zoning, if each of the resulting lots complied with zoning, then you could sell off the lot, each of the lots uh, or, well, or as many of them that complied with zoning. Right. Well, you couldn't, you couldn't use an 81L plan to create new buildable lots, right? So that's not what we're talking about because there has to be a structure on each of the lots. So if you have a lot of sufficient size that complies with zoning, you wouldn't use the 81L plan if you wanted to divide it to sell the houses. You would just use the A&R plan because you have sufficient frontage. 
So if you have a lot that's not going to create... But, but an 81L plan is an ANR plan. Well, tra the traditional ANR plan, where you ha there, there are really two exceptions to the sub definition of subcontrol, the uh, definition of, of subdivision and the subdivision control law. One where, you, where the resulting lots have sufficient frontage, um, and the other where you, ha where you have the existing structures. So if you have a lot of sufficient size that, you can, that you're not going to create new nonconformities, you're gonna, you would just use the traditional A&R plan. So w what do you say about the Howland case? Uh, doesn't that require a variance when uh, uh, you're selling off, uh, uh, you're breaking up a, an original parcel, as has happened here, um, that doesn't comply with zoning? The, the Howland case seems to suggest that you do need a variance. Well, the, the, ca the cases suggest that if you're going to do a land division and the resulting lots do not comply with zoning, you would need a variance to make them buildable. Oh, to make, to sell them. Well, I, I, I think, or, or the, Sit I think the Sitco case, which is an appeals court case, clearly said that you, they did not think you needed a variance to divide them. Um, it does, to, to read 81L as requiring a variance to do the division where you're going to create uh, nonconformities um, would seem to, to render 81L plan really a null set. There's well, just well no, because pe people oftentimes will, will divide up their land with less than a buildable lot, and they will right. transfer less than a buildable lot to somebody else who wants to increase the size of their land, you know, perhaps in a butter. But if, but if you're going to build on one of those 81L lots, you it has to be a buildable lot. Right, well, yeah, but we're not talking about um, undeveloped parcels. I completely agree. If it's an undeveloped parcel and you want to you want to sell it to someone, you're going to need, if, if it doesn't comply with zoning, you're going to need a variance to, to make it a buildable lot. We're talking about houses, we're talking about newly created lots with structures already on them. Well, then why did Mr. Putzke, Putziger, what, what was the purpose of seeking a variance in 95, if he didn't need it? I mean, I, I, I mean we I would argue it wasn't he, needed. But I don't think it matters to, pay, to in the Payless case, in our case, because a variance was secured. So in our case, there was, the division of the land was lawfully done. Right. Whether a variance was required or not required, a variance was secured. The question is, having, their, having the division happen, particularly where a variance was secured, does that mean that the structure from, from, from ever there on out requires a well, variance to change the, the structure? If the, I mean, does that depend on the fact that the variance says it, or is it as a matter of law, right? I mean, because this variance says it. It says, you, can, you know, it has to be the same. Well, the land court in this case said that did not believe that language was part of the, um, was a condition of the variance. So in our case, that language and the variance, the land Doesn't court, matter. and that has not been appealed, the land court in this case found that that was not a restriction on the future uh, alteration of the structure. If we, d if we don't agree with you and say that, yes, the variance was required to, to sell off or to, to divide these, to, divide the lots to the alienate place, these, these right. lots, um, d does that change the result? No, 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 I'm saying that it really, that's, that it's an interesting question for 81L cases, but in our case it doesn't matter because we do have a, a variance. So whether a variance was required to sell the lots in the first place, we have the variance, but either way, the structure thereon should not be affected. Do the structure thereon should not lose its Section 6 status. So the structure and the nonconformity, as right. I didn't see any nonconformity other than the dimensional nonconformity, which the wasn't really of the structure, it was really... The pre-existing the, the pre nonconformity was setback. So there, as I said, there is a relationship between a structure and a lot. Um, you, you, a structure is on a lot, and a pre-existing nonconformity may include it, a, a at relationship the time it was between all a structure and a lot. One lot. Was right. there a nonconformity? The time there was one lot, there was a side back, se, a so side there was always setback a, nonconformity. And th that was the pre-existing. Is right. that on your client's property? I mean, in other words, if it gets divided into three, yeah. that side yard her, setback may not affect all her of them. house, but right? It does, does affect it, it. Right. It, certainly, at least one other has had, had a side yard before the land division. At least two of the houses had a side yard setback nonconformity. Okay. Um, but part of the argument as well is that there's no other there's no other circumstance in Section Six where a single change in some characteristic of the lot use or structure infects the entire property. So for instance, in use cases, if you have a pre-existing non-conforming use, 
and you change that use and you lose that status as a pre-existing non-conforming use. That doesn't mean the structure from, from ever there out has to get a variance. But doesn't that it make a difference? Isn't the difference in this case that uh, a, a variance was required and obtained and that any expansion of, of, uh, of, of either the use or the structure that was covered by the variance results in a, um, a, a, well, a the, the necessity for I don't know that the, for, that for that the structure variance. was covered by the variance. The variance authorized the, the division of the, of the land. So, you don't, so think for instance, you don't think that they're intertwined, that the variance and the structure are intertwined? I mean, I, I don't think that there was, well, let's, well, I mean, we could change the circumstance. Let's say that the circumstance was we had a pre-existing non-conforming structure and we want to build an addition and that addition is going to create new non-conformities and I go and get a variance for that addition. Okay, so you have one part of the house that was authorized by variance, but it's a pre-existing house that had a pre-existing non-conformity. Now I want to do something else to the, the old part of the house that doesn't create a new non-conformity. There's nothing in the case law that says just because you got one variance for one aspect of the structure, from ever thereafter, anything else you want to do requires a variance. So a change in, there's nothing that says in section six, if you make, if, if you get one section six finding for a structure, that that's it, it's no longer a pre-existing structure and ever thereafter you have to proceed <coughs> by variance. Um, Thank you, counsel. Thank, thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Jonathan Silverstein for the Building Inspector and Zoning Board of Appeals of Tisbury with me is Catherine Lockman in my office. Your Honor, the, Your Honors, the seminal, the main issue here is whether or not, in fact, a variance was required when the division of ownership took place. And I don't think under the case law uh, and under a straight reading of the statutes involved, that can be questioned. Now, did you need the variance in order to do the 81L division? Well, because you characterize that as purely a ministerial act. That's right, Your Honor. So to record it to vision, you just couldn't alienate the land after. This. Exactly. To endorse, a, get a plan endorsed. <coughs> People get plans endorsed for any number of reasons, as the court, the appeals court in Smalley said, uh, any number of reasons to go in and get an A and R plan endorsed. And Mr. Dane keeps referring to an A and L plan, eighty uh, one uh, L plan, somehow is different from the traditional A and R plan. The, Which the is the reason for frontage it. And, and structural uh, and existing structure provisions are in the exact same definition of the term subdivision. They're well, not different in any way from one another, and they shouldn't be differently treated from one another. Except, you, well, in the sense that they are both, they, whether or not you get A and R designation depends upon compliance with the statutory language, and it's you're saying that's the ministerial act. That's right. But I mean, it may be that you could go for A and R when you had all the the, the lots um, that would be uh, dimensionally and otherwise um, in compliance with zoning, and you could do it that way. Certainly, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, someone might not be able to go in under the so-called traditional A and R process because the lot is already non-conforming as to frontage. However, it has two existing structures. They want to divide that property into two lots, each with an, an existing structure that may or may not predate zoning, but does predate subdivision control. And they would not be creating new nonconformities, would not require a variance, but would only require a Section 6 finding. So uh, that would be an example. Or they may want to do it, they might want to get the A&R approval because uh, it, Precatory to a variance, as was done here. What nonconformity was created as a result of the uh, subdivision? Lot area, this new lot. For the first time, there's a new undersized lot created. That's nope, it. Nope, the existing lot was not undersized. For the first time, a frontage violation was created. And for the first time, front yard variance was created. That's all on page 129. All right, so the there record. were additional dimensional in addition to the side That's right. Lot. And Mr. Dane would like to say, well, these are just lot nonconformities. They don't affect the structure. Well, respectfully, this court has definitively rejected that in Bransford in reasoning adopted in Bjorkland, which said it makes no logical sense whatsoever to divorce the notion of lot from the notion of structure. And you think about anything other than perhaps height, every dimensional uh, Im imposition under a zoning bylaw relates to the placement of the structure on the lot. And so you, you have 
uh, that, that would affect the structure. So here we have a new front yard setback violation for the very use, first time. You can have use, I suppose. Well, uh, that's why I said dimensional, Your Honor, but yeah. certainly you can have use, and I do think you have use under the uh, Howland case. Howland makes clear that when you change three existing structures on one lot to three structures on three new lots, that is a change of use. And so the practical effect is that, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Go ahead, no finish, I'm sorry. And the practical effect is an intensification of, uh, of the use. Because what may have been a guest house or a gatehouse is now a separate single family home. A couple of questions. What is the difference between the status of 87 Main Street and 89 Main Street? Were they in the same position? They, they were both part of the... Need a variance, in other words. You, they'd need yes, a variance. Well, then how come 89 Main Street, was that the one they got a dormer built and a second story on a garage, no variance necessary? Why? why? The, the record's silent on that, Your Honor, and, and this is what I'll say. This court and the appeals court have long said that just because building officials, prior building officials, make mistakes and don't properly enforce zoning doesn't preclude the municipality that's from your doing view. so forth. Just because they may have screwed up next door that's and right. allowed all this to happen, I don't know what was or here. wasn't done back then. Okay. What I do know is that you have, th and I think it's important, people talk about pre-existing non-conforming structures giving what's called grandfather protection. What is the protection? It's the protection of the pre-existing non-conformity. There's one pre-existing non-conformity with respect to the Paylet's house. One non-conformity predates zoning. That is the side yard setback. Right, let's, take, let's take the solution that Mr. Dane describes. Let's just say before this was subdivided, the owner of these three structures um, upgraded them all. Right. Uh, it did, did exactly what they want to do at 87. They, they, could they have done that? Absolutely not. I'm glad you asked that, that question, Justice Forty. The language of 81L, the existing structure exemption, refers to, requires that the pre-existing structure that predates subdivision control is still standing. That's the language of the statute, is still standing. So absolutely, Ms. Palitz would not be, or Mr. Potziger would not have been able to do what they're proposing to do now, which is demolish under Section 6 and rebuild a new larger structure as a, a change to a non-conforming structure, and then come in and take advantage of the, pre -exist, uh, of the existing structure exemption. And it's like a zoning freeze case law that this court and the appeals court have said, you have to pick your protection. You don't get to bootstrap one protection onto another. And that's what's attempting to be done here. So let me ask you, if instead of demolishing, they were just going to gut and um, completely remodel inside and it is exactly the same footprint, exactly the same height, do they need to do anything? No, Your Honor, because zoning doesn't regulate interior um, uh, renovations. That's building code issue. Zoning regulates use and structural dimensions. And, and, and so um, it's the fact that it has to go up a few feet. Like that's right. And in fact, it didn't, didn't, in the, its decision, didn't the board the, say that, the the, board that there was a lot of things they could do without? Exactly, Justice Botsford. The, the board specifically said you can upgrade this to, you know, to make it more livable, to improve it, to repair it. You don't need zoning relief. So, uh, and, and that's in the record. And, and no, f I'm fi finish. It, it, that, that's in the record. So absolutely. And, and clearly, Ms. Palitz, when she bought this structure, <coughs> knowing that there was a variance, knowing that the variance specifically said it was being granted because there would be no exterior alteration, was, was well on notice. And, and people buy structures all the time that, are, that cannot be altered for one reason or another, um, whether it's regulatory, whether it's a, a structure in a 40B development, whether it's subject to condo documents that prohibit exterior renovations. People buy structures all the time that can't be altered. Well, it can, it, they, it can be if, if she could meet the variance standard. Well, in other words, if instead of nine feet, she wanted to raise it one. I don't know what the board would do, but it, you could have a different result. Absolutely. My, I'm really going to uh, Mr. Dane's argument that this is, uh, it's, you can't possibly expect someone to want to 
take advantage of this uh, provision if the structure is going to be preserved in, in amber, I think was the term used. Yes, of course you can. People buy such structures all the time. Well, is this, would, this, would this property even be eligible for a variance based on the terms on which variances are granted? I, I don't want to make the case for whether or not a variance could or couldn't be, but let me give you an example. Perhaps there's something about the shape of the structure that makes it, that would create some sort of financial hardship. Then yes, I'm not going to try to make the argument as to whether or not that's possible, but it's possible. No attempt the was very made. Very limited grounds for a variance. Certainly. And what are you left with? You're left with a home on the island of Martha's Vineyard that has some 2,000 square feet and can be renovated. I, I'd say that's certainly not depriving the, uh, the property of value and affecting a taking as, as suggested by the uh, homeowners. So you're saying the pre-existing non-conforming status of this structure was wiped out by the 81L division? No, by the alienation of title, which was only affected pursuant to the issuance of a variance. Once you get a variance, you're no longer for- you needed, the you needed the variance to get the 81L exemption? No, no, you, you no. needed the variance to uh, sell off the lots that are shown on the 81L plan. A as is always the case, as this court said uh, is the case in, um, in uh, Beal, and as the courts have said not in, telling in We're Alley, not, ta we're not talking about selling off the lots. We're talking about selling off the structures. No, it's sold the lots with the structure The lots structure were sold, Your Honor. Okay, so you need, a after you get your 81L That's right. division. That's right. You then need a further variance. I mean, what's the whole point of an 81L division if it's not to, <laughs> to sell the lot? To make the properties, the structures, free to alienate. What, what's, I mean, what's the, the whole purpose point? of the 81L division can be myriad. In this case, the 81L division, and when, when you use the term 81L division, I assume you mean going in and asking the planning board to undertake the ministerial act of endorsing a plan saying what? saying this is not a subdivision that requires definitive subdivision approval under section 81U of the subdivision control law. Mm -hmm. Completely separate regulatory scheme from zoning. And what this court and the appeals court have said in dozens of cases so it doesn't is that create the nothing lots. under zoning. So it doesn't create a division actually. It creates a division on paper that can only be effectuated through further zoning relief. In this case, that further zoning relief had to be a variance. Why? Because there were new zoning nonconformities created. In the case I gave earlier, the example I gave earlier, if you were already nonconforming as to frontage, but had no, you were not going to be creating any new nonconformities, you wouldn't need a variance. You would only need a section six finding because you would only be changing the existing nonconformity. That wasn't the case here. In this instance, when the variance was granted, did it also cover the, su the pre-existing uh, nonconformity, the side yard? Did it, or did it bless all of the zoning problems, including that, or I does think that it remain? I blessed it all, and, and what, if any, effect it had on the- They didn't I, need it for the side yard. I think they probably didn't need it if they were only going to be changing something. If, let's say this was a conforming lot. They were gonna be creating a lot that was otherwise conforming, other than that existing side yard setback violation. Yeah. Yes, I think section six relief would have been appropriate. Why? Because it would have been intensifying the existing nonconformity, certainly, by creating this on a separate lot, a separate single family lot, as opposed to one of a number of guest structures on a existing larger lot. But it wouldn't have created any new nonconformities, but that's not what happened here. Once that happened and the variance was exercised, um, th that, uh, that property, that structure became a creature of and dependent on for its legal status, dependent on that variance. And to do anything further required a new or modified variance. What about the example that uh, your brother gave about, you know, if you had a piece of property that had a pre-existing non-conforming structure um, and uh, you uh, added to it and got a variance as to that uh, to allow you to construct something new, um, that would not mean that the old part of the house that was uh, grandfathered would uh, continue to be um, sort of the, uh, the uh, encompassed by the variance. The variance does not take over. What do you say about that? And the lot, you weren't putting that, you weren't affecting a new use under um, Howland. You weren't affecting a new use by changing 
three structures on one lot to one structure each on three different lots, then I think uh, it would really depend on the language of the variance and what relief was being requested. Again, what relief was requested here? Permission to create uh, a new lot and to put the existing structure on that new lot, notwithstanding these new nonconformities. That was the relief that was requested. That was the relief that was granted. No relief was granted to now expand this pre-existing structure. I won't argue that the structure does not predate zoning, but the nonconformities do not. And these new nonconformities therefore became lawful only by virtue of the variance. And the variance did not authorize any expansion or change to that structure. And you can't import section six to something that is no longer a pre-existing non-conforming structure because it is now a post-zoning non-conforming structure and only lawful by virtue of the variance. I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused by what you say. So the last sentence or phrase in the variance about, you know, this, I forget the language, but basically there's gonna be no change <coughs> in the structure. Are you saying that that, I, I thought Mr. Dane said that the judge, Judge Shire said that didn't matter. She said it was not an explicit Judge condition. Judge Shire said that's not an explicit condition. I would disagree with that. I didn't appeal because I won the case, so I wouldn't appeal, and this court can certainly uphold on any grounds. But I don't think you even have to find an ex it's an explicit condition. All you have to find is that the variance, which by its nature, and this court has ruled, variances should be narrowly construed. The variance authorized what? The creation of a new lot with this structure on it. That's it. It did not authorize what's being proposed here. I, is, is the requirement of a variance in these circumstances as opposed to a special permit determined by the Mendez case? You'll have to remind me, Your Honor. I'm, I'm sorry. I, uh, Mendez was a case that, that uh, uh, Judge Rudy Cass wrote on the appeals court, and I, all of a sudden I don't remember the circumstances of the case, but it was, um, uh, and, and he had a turn of phrase about it would be anomalous uh, to, I don't remember, even know if you cited it in, in your appeal, um, in your brief. Uh, w well, let me ask you point blank then. Why is, why cannot a special permit be used as opposed to a variance? To affect the division? Yeah, to, to, uh, to increase the height of this house by For all the feet. reasons I stated, Your Honor, because special permits are allowed in s specific stated circumstances, either under zoning bylaws or under the Zoning Act. The Zoning Act says special permit or section six finding, depending on, on how it's administered, is available to alter pre-existing nonconformities. And this Th was not These are a not pre-existing pre nonconformities. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Your Honors.